Good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, uh, this afternoon's talk by uh, Malik Dahlan. Um, he'll be introducing his, uh, his new book on the Hijaz, The, the First Islamic State. Um, I've already purchased a, a copy and started reading it. Um, I've always been interested in the topic uh, for my own interests. I, 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 uh, when I, was, I wrote a book on the origins of the Arab-Israeli conflict looking at the Hussein McMahon correspondence and that uh, involved um, Hussein Ibn Ali, one of the sheriffs of Mecca. But at, at that time, there was no book on the Hejaz. So I'm very pleased to see that there is one. Um, it's uh, very important. So um, um, uh, Malik's going to speak for about, I think, 10, 15 minutes about his book, and then we'll open it to questions. He wants it to be quite, quite um, interactive. So hopefully there'll be, there'll be some discussion. Uh, Malik is a chair professor of international law and public policy at uh, Queen Mary University in London. He's also a professor and steering committee member of the Energy Law Institute, uh, where he teaches energy law ethics, renewable energy law, and energy geopolitics. And he's also the principal of Institution Quraysh for Law and Policy, which is a multifaceted transnational professional services company in London. And you can read more about his bio on, on our website. So without much further ado, I'll open it to Malik. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming to uh, this talk or what I'm calling my Asia, the Singapore uh, launch of this book. Um, what a pleasure to be here. What a pleasure to be back in Singapore and have this discussion. And I'm very grateful to Victor and uh, the Middle East Institute for hosting me. Um, and uh, the, the funny thing is I, I was, the last time I was um, doing a research here about eight years ago, seven years ago, um, we were located at Bukitima, but I would end up coming to the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation across the street to try to figure out whether or not states in the Middle East can come together and formulate a new economic reality. By the end of my tenure here, uh, the uh, Arab Spring broke out, <laughs> and uh, all states were basically all international organizations are gone and most states seem to be failing in some form or another. Um, so I am very privileged and, uh, to, to come and speak about a book, a topic that's been uh, lingering for a while in my mind and in my heart because it is a, not only is it a piece of Middle East history, but it's really international legal history and a formulation of how states, especially under colonial periods, uh, have had to deal with the subjects, the very dicey subject of self-determination. And at the time before the question of Palestine was a very difficult and controversial topic, um, 30 years before that, colonial powers were actually dealing more with the Ottoman Hejaz, which as you can see is the northwestern part of, of uh, the Arabian Peninsula, modern day Saudi Arabia. And the reason why that area is very important is uh, it is the home of uh, Mecca and Medina, the two holiest uh, cities in Islam, uh, but also, um, as I argue in my book, the region that hosted the first Islamic State, and, and this is in the sixth century during the uh, seventh century during the uh, Prophet Muhammad. And I argue it was the first and only Islamic State, which lasted for, f for 40 years, including the Prophet's period and the four successors that came after that. And the concept of the Caliphate evolved as a result of that relationship. The second important passage in history is actually uh, about 1300 years later or 100 years ago, which is during the Arab revolt of 1916, uh, coincided with uh, the, uh, the beginning of the First World War, where the uh, rulers of Mecca um, 
uh, in cooperation with the Entente and the British, uh, began the Arab revolt against the Ottoman powers. And the first um, issue one would notice is that in a religious l locale, uh, it was kind of odd to have a nationalist movement, but that was the temperament of the time that an Arab nationalist narrative was developed. And for those of us who are involved in international law, we know that the idea of the right of self-determination or statehood used to be measured by ethnicity. So it was ethnocentric. It meant that, you know, if you were called an Arab, if you were called a, a Turk, if you were called a Greek, if you called, that's what determined what a state was. This was the case until um, the Second World War where the concept of territorial integrity b became the, 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 the definer of uh, statehood. So therefore, if you had a specific territory, no one would question that because that was the state uh, or that's what constituted statehood. Um, and in the book, um, I argue that this this configuration, whether we look at the last 100 years or 1,300 years, this was very important because I began writing the book um, when ISIS uh, as an organization, uh, and I call ISIS a neo-medievalist occurrence in statehood, and I call Al-Qaeda a, a, a post-modernist occurrence in what constitutes Islamic governance. Um, so, you know, some ideas came at the time between 2014 and 2015, at the time when I was at Cambridge, about whether or not there can be, there is such a thing as an Islamic state, as an existential, as something that continues to evolve, and this idea of a caliphate. And what I found and, uh, and what I thought was quite interesting is that this concept continues to be plagued by a lot of the grievances that happened during the colonial era. Now, if I take a step back and if I tell you what is the difference between my talk here and the talk I had at Oxford is that in Oxford, I was probably speaking to, in a place where a lot of the people who drafted the Sykes-Picot lines <laughs> were sitting and graduated from, whereas here, I'm actually speaking to territories that were very much affected by those colonial realities. Um, I'm very fortunate that to sit here, to come to a place where my great-grandfather was, um, obviously I'm much uh, n not as worthy, but my great-grandfather, Abdullah Dahlan, moved from Mecca, he was one of the last uh, uh, Imams of Mecca moved from Mecca to Cyprus, not by the British. He was actually exiled by the Sharif of Mecca. And because he refused the idea of the Arab revolt against the Ottoman, believing that that was actually against the idea of the caliphate. Funny enough, he was at a location called 207 North Bridge Road. And the reason I find, found that out was because I looked into uh, the archives of Al-Azhar. And, and at Al-Azhar, what happened was during the period of 2000, between 1920 to no 1924, which was the same period where the Paris Agreement was taking place, that was the, the Versailles Agreement uh, was taking place, there was another movement about Islam, what I call Islamic self-determination about the caliphate. So that conference was seeking more understanding of how can we actually re-establish the caliphate in 1924. And as I looked at the files, I found this letter coming from the represent, the Grand Mufti of Singapore, Abdullah Dahlan, you know, and coming from and representing the, the Meccan people out of Singapore, and 400, uh, 40 million Muslims in the, uh, you know, what he called uh, and 
what was very compelling was that he described the massacre that had occurred by what we, some of you know, as the Wahhabi incursion that came over, took over the two holy mosques, similar to what we've seen um, in the past with the ISIS situation, um, where many were massacred, many were killed, not many were reported, a very sort of intolerant, um, abhorrent view of an Islamic uh, system that now no longer, uh, hopefully, no longer exists. But anyway, what was very curious to me, he, he suggests that this is a problem that the, that the conference in Al-Azhar needs to respond to. But in his second point, he was explaining about the difficulty of managing the issue of the caliphate. So the Azhar conference asked for representation from around the Muslim world. And he was saying that unless we have proper representation, unless we have the proper expression of the people, unless we have the representation of languages and ethnicities and so on and so forth, it's very hard to achieve those things. He wrote a list of nine different, uh, and it's in the book, nine different uh, uh, criteria for countries that had representation, i.e. democracy, or and countries that whether or not they had uh, some sort of a mandatory regime over them, colonized or not colonized. Um, and ultimately reaching this sort of conclusion that it, it really is a question of practicality in dealing with the, situ the countries you're at and not being so um, um, captivated by the dogma associated with the caliphate. And I thought to myself, wow, it must be the waters and the straits, you know, that somehow you leave the Arabian Peninsula, you get out here, and you get a level of Singaporean practicality. And, 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 and it, is, it is a very loud message. So 1924, 11, the 11th of October, a letter coming out of Singapore that changes our view whether, about what is the caliphate and whether or not we need that kind of representation that so many, unfortunately, um, individuals misunderstand. And because religion has always been an identity above citizenship, it was always a, a concept that confused many. So we talk about the ummah, the collectivity, but that ne did not necessarily go with what I consider an important part of the tenets of Islamic governance. And I would summarize the most important aspect as citizenship. And we see that in the first Islamic state, which was in Medina, which had uh, the constitution of Medina, um, which listed all the tribes, Christian, Muslim, Jewish tribes working together. And I always thought, what an interesting document. Someone legislated a social contract before even having the, the gospel, the Quran, you know, completely revealed to look at what a constitution, what political formation existed. Part of my own study and background in, in constitutional intentionalism, which means that sometimes you look, it into, you look into the constitution and the law and you look at certain, what is the intention behind the law? Not the black letter, but there is a spirit, the objective of law, maqasid al-sharia al-islami. And one of the most fundamental aspects about Islamic governance is that the form of governance has never been completely disclosed. There is an abeyance, and the point is that it should withstand time and situation. For example, we never heard or read anything about the formation of a caliphate in the Quran or any text. That never existed. And that's why after the first 40 years, it moved to Damascus, it moves to, as, a, as a form of kingdom, and so on and so forth. But what we know is that citizenship was the driver. Now, I put that aside to say that all of these aspects today are just as important today as they were a long time ago. We're witnessing some serious reconfiguration, not only in the Middle East, but in the Arabian Peninsula. We're seeing some challenges extending from Yemen to, to, to Qatar and so on and so forth. And if you think about it, and if we're in the realm of international law, you'd think that the most important part 
is the territorial integrity of the Arabian Peninsula if you're thinking about it from a strategic and economic point of view. Um, and I, while there is a, a level of earnestness and morality to discuss, and as Victor shared, um, to discuss whether or not the Hejaz was a state, and I would argue that it was because it was a founding member of the Arab of the League of sorry of the League of Nations. It didn't accept the mandate system, but it wasn't allowed to continue in its role as a as a as a as a member of the League of Nations or get the protections because it had to give up Palestine. So what do you do? If you're sitting there and you'll say, well, if you give up Palestine, accept the mandate system and accept the, the, the over, over Jordan and Iraq and Syria. And the choice was very difficult. And not a lot of people know that the actual flag of the Arab revolt, which ended up being changed and, was, was, and the Hejaz was actually, is actually today the flag of Palestine. And it was a commitment by the, the, the Sharif of Mecca to give to the Palestinians when they started demonstrating that they were going to be, um, to, 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 they were going to be forsaken. The point is to say that there has been a long, a long series of breaches, and I think it goes not just because a line was drawn that Sykes, Pico came together and, and, and did this. I think it's, it goes deeper and longer. But what's more important um, is that even after the colonial period, successive um, leaders of Arab countries continue to use this idea of the nation state. And the nation state, just as a pause, is the product, from an international legal perspective, is the product of um, the Westphalian legal system that came out of the Peace of Westphalia in Europe. So in that, roughly, was adopted as the sovereign nation state in international law under the League, under the League of Nations after first world, uh, the First World War. The reason this is important is because it has a bit of tension about this idea of, of worldview. You know, people do feel that there is a problem with their engagement with the Muslim world and Muslims. But now we've become so politically correct that we don't address what this tension is exactly. So what is the collectivity? What is the caliphate? What is the ummah? I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. There is a different worldview. The question is, are we accepting that there could be a worldview that is not necessarily the Western liberal democratic model that we've been used to? And that's a question that stays out there. However, as I said, citizenship is still important. If I'm a citizen of Singapore or a citizen of of, 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 of the UK or Europe or anywhere else, that has to be respected. But does it mean that we can ignore or we should ignore completely the expression that people feel, especially what I try to argue that Mecca and Medina are important places um, for Muslims? The reason I focus on Mecca and Medina, and as I said, this, I, I'm not arguing for a separation or, a, or, or making a case for whether or not the Hejaz exists or doesn't exist. What I'm saying that there has been a serious crisis in the governance of Islam. And I think that this has become what I call the negative space, which has always and successively been claimed by factions such as Al-Qaeda, such as uh, ISIS, Frankly, the revolutionary <coughs> movements that you see in, in, in Iran, uh, the Wahhabi inclination in Saudi Arabia, which we're seeing for the first time through the Crown Prince, a sense of distancing from the negative baggage that comes out of it. But what does it mean? What do we do with this negative space? What I argue is that we need to reclaim that space and, and focus on the positive space that it's able to generate. And those are ideas by the positive space. Those are ideas that go to, in today's world, what we talk about, again, we're looking at the APEC across the street, about soft law, about incrementalism, about working in collaboration, about finding 
um, spaces for trade, for the movement of ideas, for the movement of persons, and recapturing um, this space to making it a positive, tolerant space where the rule of law can be established and can be clear and can be transparent for all um, of those 1.7 million billion humans uh, who are Muslims, um, and to be able to reset, reclaim, and reflect um, their um, their religion. Democracy is important. In those young people who rose after you know the Arab Spring, need to know that yes, it is deliberative democracy, a process that will allow them to somehow come back, that it's not a failure, that it's not an authoritarian system, it's not a zero-sum game. There is a process with which they can reclaim um, their own religion. But I also think that it's very important to remember that in order for democracy or democratic uh, expressions to succeed, you need institutions that people believe in and people can believe in. And what other and what better than Mecca and Medina for individuals to believe in and to rely on? Think about the most basic issue that can be achieved, dispute resolution. Tell me in that map how many conflicts do you know of in that region? How many for can we find to actually resolve these disputes? When we have a suicide bomb and when we have a problem on a terrorist attack, what is the phone number that will be called? We know, for example, in Catholicism, there is the Vatican. And while I'm not arguing for the Vaticanization of Mecca and Medina, what I'm saying is that we need to start having to ask the question. There was the Roman question during the Italian time. What I'm saying is that there is a Hijazi question to be asked, especially if right now we're pulling or we're, we're degrading and rooting out Wahhabism. That gap will be filled again, and that, va that vacuum will be filled again. And there are challenges. Finally, I'll, I'll just say that this is not only important for Saudi Arabia and the Hijaz as it is, I think this is critical for the um, Arabian Peninsula as it finds itself today as Western Asia, its connection with the Belt and Road and everything that exists, but also the Middle East and peace in the Middle East. I think it's an important uh, aspect for the rest of the Muslim world, as I said. But finally, I think that for the 23% of the world's population, Mecca and Medina deserve special protections and attention, not only because it belongs to the 23% of the world's population, but because it's a heritage of all mankind. Thank you.